stalk and uh, it has some sort of connection with what I've been talking about so far, I was talking about yesterday, about the importance of stillness and something a little bit about nimittas. But today we're going to go to the ninth fact of the Eightfold Path. No sound. Yay. Okay, I'll change the talk. The talk will be on silence. <laughs> <coughs> Can you hear? Is there? Hasn't been turned on? It's okay. Okay, very good. So, on the ninth factor of the Eightfold Path. <laughs> what on earth can that be? Because when I started looking through the Eightfold Path, you thought, well, what's after? You have all these wonderful eight factors that I view, the uh, motivation, the speech, action, livelihood, just the effort, and the, oh, I call it really right restraint is better, and the mindfulness and the stillness. What happens next? Is that it? Just become still? And so the ninth factor of the Eightfold Path is right insight. <laughs> hey, Ajahn Brahm, shouldn't that be number seven? The uh, Satipatthana? Satipatthana is not insight. Satipatthana is just, just how you get strong um, mindfulness and then empower your stillness and then the insight, the liberation comes next. So why isn't it part of the Eightfold Path? Because it's not the path, it's the destination. It's where you go to when the Magga, the path, reaches its destination. So you might call that the ninth factor, the right insight. And of course, where sort of I started thinking like that was when I was looking at through the, the Eightfold Path and you would think the Eightfold Path is a section of suttas called the Anguttara and Nikaya where they sometimes translated as numerical discourses, where they uh, list everything according to their number. So four noble truths you find in the fours, three characters of resistance find in the threes, the six sense bases you find in the six and the sixes, the seven enlightenment factors in sevens, and in the eightfold path it's not in the eights at all. Oh, this is weird. The eightfold path. Probably the most uh, uh, famous or well-known part of the Buddhism with eight factors in it and it's nowhere to be seen in that collection. But then you carried on and there it was in the tens. Because you have the Eightfold Path plus what happens next. And that is just the insight, the liberating insights. And then followed by the last fact, the knowledge, the understanding of liberation. So, now we go on to the ninth factor of the tenfold path. The eight plus two, what happens when you follow that path? But with that insight, we always need as well to understand how it supports everything on this path. The insight, seeing clearly, seeing you know, what's going on in our life. Otherwise, we just tend to follow what everybody else does. Now, of course, the first thing is that people say, oh, once you've done samatha, then you do insight. Once you do insight, then you do samatha. How do they relate together? And I always remember when Ajahn Chah was asked that question, he says, there's no difference. And his simile was putting up his hand 
and he said, now you see the front of my hand. You cannot see the back of my hand. But he said, I guarantee it is still there. And to prove the point, he flipped it around. Now you see the back of my hand, but the front of my hand is still there, he said. Because the front and the back of the hand, you cannot separate them. And my simile was making it a little bit more interesting. And similes, they actually grow. So I made a simile up of the two meditators. And that was called Sam Atta and Vi Pasana. Sam and Vi, who lived together. And one day, Sam and Vi, Sam Atta is the word for, for calm, for peace. Sam Atta meditation. Vi, Vi Pasana, that's like, supposed to be insight meditation. So Sam and Vi were living together and one afternoon after lunch, they decided to go for a walk up Meditation Mountain. And because they were going for a walk up Samadhi Mountain, they decided to take their two dogs with them. One of their dogs was called Metta, and the other dog was called Anapana. So Metta and Anapana <laughs> walked together up Meditation Mountain, with their two dogs. Now the reason why Sam wanted to go up there, he just liked the peace and quiet. It was so silent at Meditation Mountain. As for Vi, she was a professional photographer, worked for National Geographic or something like that. And so she wanted to go up to take these amazing photographs because the higher you got up Meditation Mountain, the further you could see. And um, Meta the dog, why does a dog want to do anything? Much wiser than human. They just go up there for fun, just to enjoy going up Meditation Mountain. Anapana just tagged along. So Sam, Phi, <laughs> Anapana, and Meta, the two dogs, walked up Meditation Mountain. And when they only got halfway up, it was so peaceful up there that Sam was already satisfied. Oh, the stillness, the silence was just so profound and deep and energizing. But Sam also had a pair of eyes. And in that deep silence, he could see so far into the distance. And Vi, his partner, she was taking all these incredible photographs. But she too did not want to click that, um, whatever you call it, the button too hard because it disturbed the silence. She also respected a deep silence. And Meta the dog, wow, she had to restrain herself to keep yapping and barking because her tail was wagging so fast, she was so happy up halfway up Meditation Mountain. And the other dog, Anapana, was fading away, it was disappearing. So they continued up Meditation Mountain. And when they got to the top of Meditation Mountain, that was absolutely still. Wow, that was just so still that hardly anything moved except for the Wi-Fi making incredible insight photographs to keep for eternity. She could see the whole universe mapped out there with nothing between her and infinity. She was taking these amazing shots, but he could, she could also appreciate the deep peace. And Meta, the dog, Meta was running around silently and wagging her tail like it's going to fall off, which dogs do when they're blissed out with ecstasy. So Meta was just enjoying everything. And Anapana, the breath, couldn't be found. It disappeared. Because in deep samadhi, your breath vanishes. It cannot be found. No more with Anapana, the dog, will come back later on, halfway back down the mountain. And <laughs> So the reason I say that simile is because 
up on top of Meditation Mountain is not just the stillness. It's also the great view, the insights, and also what many people miss out, the beautiful loving kindness, the joy and the happiness. Now why do I say loving kindness and joy and happiness? There was recently a book done by the uh, lady in Hong Kong, Anita Murajani. And finally, after many years, I learned how to pronounce that name. <laughs> she had one of these out-of-the-body out experiences. And she went out of her body and into this incredible light where she merged into this peace and bliss. And you know, that's the classic sort of out-of-the-body experience, going into nimittas and getting jhana experiences after you're dead. And then she came back again afterwards. And just as an aside, because that whole process of letting go of your body, your five senses shutting down, going towards the light, going into the light and merging with bliss, with pure love, that's often what happens when you get jhanas. So if I haven't told you yet, this jhana meditation practice, it is actually learning how to die. I know people didn't ask me, can we have some death meditations? Well, this is it. <laughs> Haven't you heard when, <laughs> when people sort of die and they come back afterwards, what do they do? You know, the five senses, they shut down. Sometimes they try and shout in their ear, anyone there? Ajahn Brahm, are you there? And in deep meditation, you can't hear anything. Sometimes they open the eyes and they put the light in the eye. And, but as one of the people here told me recently, I better not say who it is, but he was <laughs> saying that's the last part of the body which stops when you die, the pupils. You know that? Because the pupils... Dilate, yes. <laughs> and the person who told me that joke is here on this retreat, by the way. <laughs> but, but when you're dead, you can't see, you can't hear, you can't feel. And what happens? You go towards the light. You've heard people say about that? Which is one of the reasons why when uh, people are dying, you don't want them to die yet. You look in their eyes and say, don't go towards the light. And then they're okay, don't go towards the light. <laughs> Stay alive. <laughs> but no, in meditation, obviously, this just happens naturally. And the reason I mention this is because when this lady uh, described her experience, what she said that she was merged into pure love, happiness, bliss, because that experience of um, unconditioned, unbounded loving-kindness is one other way we describe the bliss in even first jhana. There's no distinction there between acceptance, peace. You don't have to prove yourself. You don't exist anymore. You've gone. You've disappeared. You've vanished. And instead you just merge into a great big bliss for long periods of time, where you can't think, you can't do anything, until you come out afterwards. That experience, you can describe that like most times when you come out afterwards in so many different ways. While you're in there, it's the same experience. Beautiful bliss. What many people say is like pure love. I mean, really pure. In other words, no difference between you and anybody else merged into a sense of oneness. So that's one of the reasons why Meta the dog is, belongs up on the top of Meditation Mountain with jhanas, with insight, with everything. So anyway, that was the simile which I had to show that it doesn't really matter if you think you're doing insight meditation or you're doing samatha meditation or metta meditation. They all come up to this leaving the body I don't mean just floating out of it, 
believing the world of the five senses and just going into a deep state of bliss in the mind. So, samatha, vipassana, they're just two sides of the same coin. The front of the hand, the back of the hand. And they always go together, right from the very beginning of the path. If you want to calm things down, you can try and using willpower, but I never found that willpower works. What I do find is my wisdom power, otherwise known as insight. So little things, like when you're sitting down, how long do you need to meditate for? to actually to get deep meditation. And this is where you use insight. And the insight is like, who knows? You don't even bother to count the minutes and the time. Because to get to be still, we have to let the past go, let the future go, and be in the present moment. So there's no time. But, now we have the first problem with insight meditation or using insight meditation. How the heck do you let the past go and the future go? Sounds easy, doesn't it? Come on, just let go. Come on, let go. How many times do I have to tell you? Let go, let go. <laughs> and that's obviously an exaggeration, but that's sometimes what people do, they get so frustrated trying to let go. <laughs> so, but, so, how do we do with our frustration? What actually works? And one of the ways of letting go of the past and the future, it seems to be counterintuitive, but it's actually to be kind to the past and the future. Give it this beautiful loving kindness. My past, it's been a lot of pain, a lot of disappointments, a lot of happiness too. But I'm going to be kind to the whole lot of it. Past, the door of my heart is open to you. Come in. And when the past is let in that way, with kindness, it softens the past. It's not so hard, not like a ball, like a diamond, scratching you, hurting you, it's just so soft, like a teddy bear. <laughs> soft and cuddly. It doesn't disappear, it's just its shape and its texture of the past alters. And once it's soft like that, it's very easy then to put it down, to be able to let it go. But softening it, first of all, is one of the great ways. And that counterintuitive way was taken to a wonderful extreme, for me anyway, when I heard that the opening the door of your heart simile, softening the past, was used for people who had real intensive trauma from the past. And this was that group of people who had come to Australia as refugees who had been tortured and raped and beaten in these underground cells somewhere in this world. And the fact that they even survived was just an amazing testament to the hope that something may change and they may one day find some freedom from those dark prison holes of pain. But what happens is they come to Australia, which is a, a wonderful country despite what people say about it. When you're here you don't appreciate just how peaceful, how kind and how free this world is, this country is. But they come here, their bodies are free, but their minds are still in those prison cells being beaten and raped and tortured. It's a trauma. And I was so pleased, actually so um, honoured and you know, a little bit sort of, um, what's the word, so amazed that some of these little stories 
which I never expected to be used in such places, were now one of the best techniques to allow people to come out from those traumas. They had freedom of body, but not freedom of mind when they came here. They were still in those torture chambers. Flashbacks, memories, anxiety attacks, for what they'd been through. They hadn't become free yet. So apparently, some of these psychologists and therapists who are volunteering you know, to try and help rehabilitate, give a life to the people who'd come and escaped and had actually had physical freedom. What they told them to do, encouraged them that when they felt safe in their own time, they would actually sit down comfortably and they would do the open the door of your heart insight practice. What they would do, they'd imagine a heart in their chest, with their eyes closed. And it was always going to be a Valentine's Day heart. I remember, just I said, I went to autopsies many times and see real hearts. But those real hearts, they're a bit sort of ugly and they've just got tubes going all over the place. And so sometimes they're not really the sort of heart it's easy to imagine. But a nice Valentine's Day heart is so easy for people to visualise. And so the people who'd been traumatised, not their own fault, imagine this heart in their chest. But visualising it to the best of their ability would then imagine two doors in the middle of that heart. The double doors like we have here or just behind me. And imagine those doors opening and the person inside of them who they were content with and happy with, the present part of their life, was inside. And they looked down and outside in the cold, hungry, rejected, stigmatized, were those little versions of them, the little girl who was brutally raped, the boy who was beaten, the people who had lost all hope of human kindness. That was you out there, rejected, in pain, cold, unloved, out there on the ground, outside of your own heart. And what happened was then you imagine a staircase, a staircase going down from your heart where you're standing warm, well-fed, happy, content, there's something missing you haven't done yet. You put this staircase down to the ground. And there you see all those little versions of you, the ones which have been badly hurt. And they're afraid. You encourage each one of them to come up those stairs, to walk up. And they need all the encouragement you can give them to come up, into your own heart, where you embrace and say, this is part of me. Never again will I reject you, my past. The door of my heart is always open, come in. Even though it's painful to feel that trauma, still, when you bring it in to your heart, instead of rejecting and keeping it out, when you embrace it, you're being kind to your past. You're being a friend to it. And it takes off the hard edges, the coldness, the sharpness, the pain. And most of it vanishes. 
It's part of you. It's your history. But as soon as you soften that past by letting it come in, instead of always rejecting it, trying to keep it outside, trying to find some place where you can't feel that pain, when you bring it in, there is the catharsis, the change. You never forget that pain. It doesn't hurt anymore. It's part of who you are. And seeing that, I was the reason why when I say this story, which I've said many times, I look at the floor because it's, it's quite moving, because it works. You've seen people who have been traumatized in such a way. People who have come from overseas and why that happened to them, I don't know. But it's a way of actually moving forward, not rejecting it. Unfinished business which has to be faced and has to be embraced and become part of you is now come home. And once it does come home, it's easy to go on with your life. You're not held back by this unfinished business of things which are unresolved. This is an act of forgiveness for yourself. You're kind to your past. You're not guilty. You're not ashamed. When that comes up, it is forgiving the past. And it's, it's an insight practice. So you bring it up, bring it in, embrace it, and then it vanishes. Instead of trying to suppress it and trying to think it didn't exist in all the different ways of our denial mechanisms. But when that sort of happens, you're softening the past. You're not blaming anybody because the blaming anybody means you're still their victims. I said the other day that it's one of the, the great powers we have, the power to forgive. People have hurt us. And that gives us victory over that pain when we actually forgive. It's no longer going to hurt me anymore. So this is actually how we soften the past. We let it go after we've softened it with kindness. And then it's not that hard. And as for the future, we have to soften the future as well. And by softening the future, it's always the fear we have that something bad is going to happen to us. That fear of something bad going to happen to us, you can soften that by all these times what we're afraid of, often we make happen. Or rather we certainly increase the probability that it happens. There was this one person, I shouldn't really say who she was, she was she was in Singapore and she was afraid that her wife was having some sort of affair. She wasn't. She was a very good wife. But because he was suspicious, he hired a PA. No, not PA, that's a, a private detective, whatever. What do you call private PI, PI okay. A PA is your, your personal assistant. <laughs> So I hired a, a private investigator, a PI, to follow her. And of course, when she found out, she said, you don't trust me. And so what's the purpose of having a marriage without trust? So the marriage fell apart. Because of suspicion of something which she, she never had done, that suspicion, she read that as a lack of trust. So the relationship was over. The thing he was most afraid of, he actually contributed to happening. So it's one of the reasons why that even when there is some sort of, um, what, what was it, my particular example, first example, was when I was very young and my mother told me 
that I had a dentist appointment the following morning. So I, now, first of all, she told me I didn't need to go to school the next day. Yay! Because you've got to go to the dentist. Mm, okay, I'm going to go to school. <laughs> so now you've got to go to the dentist. And you may think that going to the dentist is not such a big thing. But if you know those dentists, you know, 50, 60 years ago, those dentists 60 years ago, the drills they used were nowhere near as advanced as they were these days. They got out this drill. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't quite like that, but it's pretty close. <laughs> they were all down, you can hear them. As you were sitting outside, it didn't sound all that inviting. And if you did have to have an injection, they were just these old needles which were recycled. You didn't have single-use needles in those days, all recycled. And you could see the sort of the nurses sharpening them up before <laughs> they'd stab you with it. And you saw all these sharp little instruments and pliers. It was like, you know, for a kid, it was like going to a torture chamber going to the dentist in those days. It didn't look that sort of inviting. And of course, being a kid, you'd sort of exaggerate it anyway. So I had to go to the dentist the following morning and I just did not want to go. And I was just so upset. So I tried everything, throwing tantrums, just um, uh, screaming, shouting. But my mum said, no, you have to go in the morning. So when I went to bed, I didn't sleep, I started planning. How can I escape from going to the dentist tomorrow morning? I had all these schemes and, and my main one was actually just uh, appealing to a mother's love for her child. And I said, Mum, you obviously don't love me. You're taking me to the dentist, but I do love you. Well, why are you taking me to the dentist? And she dragged me there. I must have gave my mother such a headache. But when I got to the dentist, you know what happened? I found out my appointment had been cancelled. All that kicking and screaming, all of that lack of sleep, for something which never happened. And I learned from that. I always remember that experience. Why be afraid when you don't know if it's going to happen? So all that fear for nothing. And later on, I remember getting a bicycle. And I was so afraid of falling off. I grabbed those handlebars. I was only about 10 or 11. I would grab those handlebars till my knuckles went white. And I was so stiff, being afraid of falling off. I kept falling off. Because you know, if you're... Riding a bicycle, you have to balance. When the bike goes around the curve, you have to you know, go with the bicycle. And I was so tight and stiff that my body wouldn't adapt to the curves, the bumps, whatever, and I kept falling off. What I was afraid of the most, I contributed to happening. All oh, that story of the, the, um, the woman in the Cancer Support Association in Cottesloe. 25, 26 years I've been going there, every year. And one of the reasons why I keep going there and keep getting invited is the very first time I went there, a woman who had just been uh, given the all clear, she was in remission from a breast cancer, she asked a question which no one else was able to answer. She was gone through such a painful experience of breast cancer and she was afraid if it might come back again. So she had anxiety, quite understandable. So she asked me, Ajahn Brahm, what would happen if the cancer came back? I don't think I can stand it. And my answer wasn't flippant, but it was concise and to the point. My answer was, what would happen if it didn't come back? And it was the answer she needed, because she was always looking at the negative part of the future. 
and I had taught her the kind, positive part of the future. What would happen if it didn't come back? And you know that for the past 25 years, the cancer never returned. But she comes back every year, <laughs> just to see me, to remind me. It didn't come back. And you can understand why. If you start saying, what would happen if it came back, what would happen if it came back, you're creating fear. And that fear is increasing the likelihood of the cancer returning. If you have that positive attitude, you're increasing the chances it's not going to happen. It's being kind to the future, looking at the future with a kind mind. And you find this is much more powerful than just um, chance, increasing your chances. Usually what you look for in the future is often what you find. It's as if, well, it's the old saying, when you water the flowers, the flowers grow. If you water the weeds, then the weeds grow. What you look for in another person is what they show you. What you look for in the future is often what you find. Sometimes, looking at the future with a negative mind, not a kind mind, blocks you. Even to the point that, how many days to go, I'm not sure, but you've got good meditation yet? You've got nimittas yet, jhanas yet? And you think, oh, there's only a few days to go, I'm not going to get there. If you look with a positive mind, why not? These things happen. See what happens. Look at the future with kindness. Then you find, when you soften the future, any fears, any aspirations of the future tend to disappear. And that is where deep meditation happens, right now, in this moment. You're learning some insight into how to find peace and happiness and meaning and bliss, not so much in the future, but right now, by being kind to the past, kind to the future, and then it disappears, here in this moment. And of course, the next thing to do is to be kind to this moment. Why is it, using insight, that people have this wonderful opportunity just to be here, just to relax, be in this moment? Why is it that people keep thinking about stuff? There are real problems you think about. And then once you've dealt with the real problems, there's the sort of problems you have to think about. And then there's the meaningless problems to think about. And there's the anything to think about. <laughs> Just like people come home and they, they turn on the TV. What's on the TV? Anything will do. They're not looking if there's a movie on this evening or a football match or a newscast. It's anything. So they're just searching for something to distract themselves. Why? What are you distracting yourself from? Why can't people just learn to be here? What's so wrong with being here? What are you afraid of? And a lot of time, <laughs> It is because we're afraid of finding out the truth, the reality, what's really happening right now, which is why we're always escaping from stuff. First of all, we think we're not good enough, there's something wrong with us. Other people can get enlightened, but not me. Some people say, oh, Ajahn Brahm, he was probably born with a bald head, which actually, I think, was true. <laughs> But I wasn't always sweetness and light. I did some terrible things you know, to my parents. Very naughty kid. And of course, one of the naughtiest things which I did, which just comes up right now, was my mother's birthday present. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who know this story. I can't remember exactly the age, but it was one of those ages, six, seven, eight, you know, just when you're a really cute little kid. Such a cute little kid. 
that when I offered my mum a surprise birthday present, I'd got the box, wrapped it up myself and put the present inside and it was all just like a six or seven year old kid could only do. He did it by himself, a nice little bow to mummy with love from your son. And ah, just my mother was just melting with pride and joy. Her own little six, seven year old son had got something special for her and wrapped it up himself. Ah, that was so cute. And then she started slowly to unwrap it. And I just had such strong restraint (laughs) not to laugh, (laughs) not to give the game away, because you didn't know what was inside. And of course, those of you know the contents inside at that time in that part of London, there was a food craze of, of jellied eels and mashed potatoes. And so I, as a six or seven year old, saved up some pocket money and went to the shop to buy an eel, not a jellied one, but a live one. (laughs) (laughs) And that was the contents of the box, (laughs) a live eel. (laughs) Mummy, happy birthday. (laughs) (laughs) And she opened it up and when she opened the lid, I could not have trained that eel any better. (laughs) The eel, as soon as the box was open, lifted up its head and stared at my mum. (laughs) Ah! (laughs) And I don't know what happened next, because I ran. (laughs) (laughs) And hid for two or three hours. It was my exit strategy before that word was common in military jargon. So that's what a very kind, wonderful, soft, compassionate child I was when I was born. (laughs) Anyway, so so sometimes we think we have the insight, or rather it's a false insight, that we're not good enough. We can't do it. We think, I've been trying all this time, not me. Maybe other people can get nimittas or jhanas and stuff, but not me. That's one of the greatest insights you start with, that kindness to this moment. Give yourself the benefit of the doubt. Maybe you can. Be kind to this moment. Open the door of your heart to this moment so anything is possible. With that sort of courage, that trust, that insight that things are possible. And sometimes you look at all these stories of monks and nuns in the time of the Buddha, all from different stratas of society, all from different characteristics, and all managed to become enlightened beings. And that's wonderful to see that anyone can be enlightened these days. (laughs) And that's a positive, not as though, oh, anyone can become a monk these days, the standards have gone down, but no. It means that it's possible. And that's like being kind. Openness, not closing off. But open to the past, open to the future, open to the present. And you see what happens. And that means when you're open to this moment, this is really interesting, let's let this moment be and just find out about it. And not trying to, to um, judge this moment or judge yourselves. And that's one of the other parts of the insight, you know, the judgment. And I can't judge. Can you? Can you judge another person? They're good, they're bad, who knows what they are. Do you know why they did those things? And all the different, different um, influence they had on their lives. Why they did that. And sometimes when you you go deeper and deeper and deeper into it. When I look at, uh, say, one of the monks or an agaricus who do something wrong, wrong? Well, by worldly standards it might be wrong. But you ask, what were they doing? Or why were you doing it? And when you go into it, you can't make a decision at all whether that was good or bad. Or They were trying their very best. Sounded like a good idea at the time, but they made a mistake. There was this... Uh, this woman years ago, 
She was working up in the, the north of Western Australia, in the, mine, in the mines, with her best friend. I think they'd grown up together, you know, at school. And her best friend's partner. I'm not sure if they were married, but they were certainly sort of uh, living together. So one day up in the north, there's nothing to do, and working up in the mines, she asked her friend, well, let's go for a drive and bring your boyfriend. And they said, didn't want to go, just wanted to relax. She said, no, come for a drive. So she taught them into going for a drive. And when they went for that drive, they, the road was not that good, and the, the car rolled over. She lost control. She was a driver. Her best friend was paraplegic, and her best friend's partner, the love of her life, was killed. And she wasn't injured. She wasn't even hurt. And I remember her coming to see me at Nodamara Temple and just saying that if I had only just followed their advice and just watched the movie instead of arguing with them and, uh, and convincing them to come out for a drive, my best friend I grew up with would still have her legs, could walk. She'd have the love of her life, who's now dead, because of me. And sometimes you can say, say to them, well, it wasn't your fault, you never intended to do it. But that doesn't cut it with people who feel that type of guilt. You have to feel another way to actually to get that insight, to overcome that past trauma. And for her, it was, okay, you feel you could have done better. How about doing better now by volunteering in the Osborne Park Rehabilitation Centre? Volunteer there. Go and help serve others who have maybe lost their legs and can't walk. They need some, some help. And I was saying that, obviously, not that she would be able to help others, but she would get that help from serving others, to feel that she was not um, a bad person. She hadn't made a mistake. She was not a hopeless, useless case who was going to have to be guilty for the rest of her life. Because that's one of the things when we serve others, we think we're giving, but we're not. We're learning so much when we give to others just about the nature of our world, and that the imperfections which we feel we're responsible for, we look at those and they're just something completely different. They're not imperfections. They're just the two bad bricks in the wall which make the wall, the wall look beautiful. Little by little, she learned to accept herself and be at peace, no matter what. She learned how to be kind to herself and not to think she deserves never to have happiness again. Little by little, we have that insight to allow ourselves to be a friend to this moment, to love ourselves, to love ourselves enough to be able to give ourselves some of the greatest of gifts. One of those insight methods, if you want to try this when you are meditating, you imagine two visualizations. And the visualizations are giving yourself a present. Not an eel in a box. <laughs> <laughs> but you imagine just sitting down, closing your eyes, and imagine giving yourself a gift wrapped up, and you imagine opening it slowly, seeing the, the card to me with love from me. And you see, as you open it inside, forgiveness, whoever you imagine forgiveness to be, on a card, on a flower, just on a beautiful aroma. When you open it, you can smell that aroma of forgiveness. 
we're giving ourselves the gift of forgiveness. You're giving yourself a gift of love. Sometimes you could put love in that box. Not from anybody else. You give it to yourself. Just open this box in your meditation. To me, with love for me. Love. Respect. Because once you can allow yourself to be respected, to be receive your own kindness and love, then you find you won't spend so much time running away from yourself. Being busy, not because you have to, because you're running away from something. Love, forgiveness, so you don't need to run away anymore. Once you can have that insight, then the doors for peace are open to you. You can sit there, and you don't have to keep on trying to find your respect in the words of other people. You don't need to try and please others. You don't need to measure yourself by how other people regard you. Because you've given yourself that respect. You don't need to seek love and affirmation from others. And sometimes I wondered, not just for the, the sensuality you know, of having a relationship. I had relationships before I was a monk. But why? And what was the attraction, other than the sensual attraction? And often I remember it was because somebody else you know, would look at me and say, you're just a wonderful young man. It was just that affirmation that somebody actually cared for me and loved me and thought I was wonderful. Sometimes it didn't last. But that was one of the highs of a relationship. And now as a monk of many years, enjoying being satisfied with a celibate life. I look and find you don't need that affirmation from another person because you understand that you are more than good enough. You're at peace with yourself. And only when you're at peace with yourself, when you have that kindness to who you take yourself to be, only then, when you're kind to the past and kind to the future, kind to the present, when you're kind to this thing called yourself, only then can it disappear. Can you let it go? Only then can you be sitting here and just the body starts to vanish and you're fine with that. And you, as you regard yourself, vanishes you are fine with that. Only when you are kind to the past, the future, kind to the present, kind to your idea of who you think you are, when you are kind to all of that, then it can vanish. So be kind to your breath. Let it go whichever way you want. Body, you can just disappear. Only then can you leave this five sense world from a place of kindness and acceptance and peace. And then you go off into the jhanas. Kind to these lights, these nimitas, they come, they go, they're brilliant, they're dull. Kind to them until they get so brilliant, so powerful, that you just go inside of them. You can only do that with the kindness which can let things be. dealing with the problems, settling them with kindness, and then they can vanish. It's a little bit of insight of how through insight practice you can vanish, disappear and go deep into the meditations. And after all, just the path of kindness 
loving kindness. It's not an addition, not a separate path. Anapana disappears here, but metta goes all the way to the top. The bliss can sometimes be experienced as powerful loving kindness. The powerful loving kindness I remember feeling in front of that monk, Ajahn Tate, calmed me down almost instantly so I didn't have any questions. The real insight was not the answer to the questions. The real insight was feeling I was good enough, accepted at peace. So all my busyness, all my mental agitations, all calmed down, just being in the presence of a very amazing, kind monk, all disappeared. We were replaced by so much peace and bliss. I didn't need to be anything different. I didn't need to, to change myself or to improve. To me, improvement is a form of self-hatred, a real will. Cure yourself, you just get worse. Care for yourself, and everything gets better. So this is how to care for your past. Don't cure it. Care for your future. Don't fear it. Care for this present moment. You're good enough. Care for the moment. And then it disappears. The path of insight. Loving kindness. Samatha. It's all one path looked out through so many different angles. So, that's the talk for this morning. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. <laughs> so, and I don't know which way these talks go. You start thinking you're going to talk about one thing and something else comes up. Such is life. Okay, so we're going to have the interviews now. And please be on time because the last interview at 10 past 10 is really just a, a phone call from um, Achawayama and Venerable Sevi. So please keep on time there so I can talk to those friends. <laughs>